We record. All right. So this whole week is still about oxygen. Um, so today we're going to look at ethers, phenols, and thiols. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll look at aldehydes and ketones. And, and this is really exciting to me because I've never had this class where we didn't have a snow day, um, which is which is like a luxury, um, which is why we tend to get done a little bit on more efficiently, because usually I lose like a week of school this term. Um, so ethers, it's an oxygen in the middle. Um, so they are made from alcohols. They're made in a dehydration reaction with alcohols, but they keep the temperature lower. So you don't lose all the oxygens, like one of the oxygens stays there. And so there is an IUPAC way. So IUPAC is this international union of chemists that came up with this very systematic way of naming where we number. That's this whole thing we were doing on the study set where we always have these numbers. That's the IUPAC way. Um, over here, like the 2-methyl-1-propanol, that was IUPAC. This is a common way of naming where we recognize what it is. So I am very much able to do the IUPAC for the ethers, and, and I might show you one or two, uh, but most people don't name them that way. Most people just name what's on each side of it and call it an ether. So for like this one, we say, okay, it's an ether. That's the ending. Um, and each side of it, those are isopropyls. So you tell me there's two isopropyls. So um, I write both eyes. I write diisopropyl because that's how I say it, diisopropyl. You can drop one of the eyes. I really don't care. That's like a preference. I don't know what the answer is. Um, yeah, and and so we put the YL ending because what we're doing is we're saying it's an ether and there's an isopropyl on each side of it. Um, so like this one, there's my ether. You can circle your oxygen. That's actually something that can be helpful. And you say each side alphabetical. There's actually another way of naming these, but we're just not going to go there. So methyl ethyl so we say um ethyl methyl ether it's kind of like a tongue twister ethyl methyl ether um the iupac i'm going to show you on this one the iupac is that this is ethane so we name it ethane the longest chain and then we say that this piece, oh, I have orange. we say that this is my side group. And that side group, this whole piece is a side group, is called a methoxy. So you can see why I don't want to teach it that way. So it'd be called a methoxyethane. That's the IUPAC name. Nobody uses that except in an organic chemistry class. Um, I'm aware of the name, um, and I'm sure there's like Khan Academy probably teaches it all by IUPAC or something, but everybody calls it ethyl methyl ether. The ether that's used like to knock people out, that ether, um, and it's called ether because of that property of ethers, that ethers um, make us lightheaded. And so the five states of matter, most people ignored the fifth state, but there was earth, uh, water, air, and fire. So solid liquid gas, and then fire transmuted things between solid liquid gas, and eventually to the ether. And so the ether is ethereal, that's where that word comes from, but that's the spiritual realm that nobody, we, we don't seem to quite understand. Um, but that's where the name came from, because you become unconscious. This ether, that is used in hospitals traditionally is diethyl ether. So when some places, and this is also more for Melanie because she'll be, you'll probably actually work with ethers. Um, 
if it's just labeled ether, they're referring to diethyl ether. It's probably because it's made from ethanol. And so if you heat ethanol in the presence of sulfuric acid at a low temperature, it's really easy to end up with diethyl ether. And I think ethanol over time might become kind of like that. All right, on this one, so ether, you start with the oxygen in the middle, and then you just draw each side. It does not matter what you draw on which side. You can put one above. You put them any way you want. But on one side, you're going to have a cyclohexyl. No ring. We don't have. We're not here yet. Um, and then the other side, we have a propyl. So I just want to make sure you realize that is not a propyl. That would only have two zigzags. So we need one more. So one, two, three. Um, so propyl and cyclohexyl. All right. This picture here. We're not going to name this. I honestly have no idea how to name it. It's probably some famous molecule, but I have it on there because we're going to start um, seeing a new game that shows up like next Wednesday on your celebration. And before that, you know, there's a whole page on here. And that is identifying. So it's not going to ask you to, to um, name it. It just wants you to identify the functional groups. So that that's an ether. That's a methyl sticking off there. And so it's an oxygen between two carbons. Um, oh, my thing seems to be really fuzzy today. Wonder why. All right. This is an ether. Now, one of the things, and it kind of, the answer Philip gave me helped me to remember to say this. The oxygen, it can be attached to a benzene ring or it can be attached to a methyl. It can be attached to anything. It's just it's an oxygen in the middle. This is an ether. Uh, this OH over here is just a regular OH. That would be an alcohol group. So when I ask you to identify the functional group, that's what I mean. An OH is an alcohol, an oxygen in the middle like that is an ether. And then there, we just have a regular double bond. That is an alkene. So E-N-E -E means, oh, it's a double bond between them, between carbons. Um, any questions? All right, so let's talk about ethers. And so properties, um, you see these each, like I scrunched a whole bunch of stuff on one page. Where do I go after this? Yeah, we're, we're not doing a lot with reactions today. So some of you might be going, some people never really like them. So polar, nonpolar. Well, they have oxygen and oxygen always pulls. So they are polar because of the oxygen. Solubility, so their solubility, uh, yes, to a point. So it's kind of how I answered the question with the alcohols. I said, oh, yeah, they're soluble, except, so what do I mean to a point? Go ahead. Somebody who's going to answer. It depends on how big the, the chain is or how much stuff is around it. Because if yeah, there's too so, many carbons, it'll be nonpolar. Yeah, so it's the number of carbons. It's a surface area thing. And so diethyl ether, um, it is soluble. Probably this one is. Um, I am not sure that this one would be. I don't know. Um, it's a surface area thing, too. So this guy would be, prob I don't know, it's got four oxygens, but it's really big, so probably not. Um, you would more have questions where you're comparing two things. And this actually goes back to the very first lab where we had hydrophobic. So something might have an oxygen on it, but if it has 15 carbons, it's not going to like water. It's going to be hydrophobic. So if it has a whole bunch of oxygens, 
or an area that has a bunch of oxygens and a bunch of carbons, that's where we get the amphiphilic or amph yeah. All right, so boiling point versus an alkane. Which one's gonna be higher and why? So the ether or the alkane? Anybody? Anybody else? Go ahead. The alkane because it has the double bond, so it has higher boiling no. point. Oh. It, the ether is higher. The ether is higher because it's polar, because of the oxygen. The oxygen pulls, uh, and so it doesn't make H bonds. So when you're doing boiling point, it's only the ether there. And so we don't have an OH, but the oxygen still pulls. And that was uh, back in Chem 104. Your teacher would have called it a dipole dipole or a DD or a dipole. So there is a pool. You can just be, it has oxygen. Like when I ask you to give a reason, most people write one word. You can write oxygen, you can write polar, you can put dipole. Do not put H bond. Doesn't have an H bond. So the ether, more than an alkane. But an ether versus an alcohol, which one's going to be? The ether here, the ether is higher than the alkane. And then versus the alcohol, the ether is lower. So why is the ether lower than the alcohol? I just gave the answer. Is anybody? It cannot H bond. That H bond, so when I teach H bonds in Chem 104, I teach that an H bond is really a dipole. It's a pool, but it's a super pool. It's like a Sherpa pool. Sherpas are like superhuman. Um, and so it's it's a super extra big dipole. Um, and so the alcohol, an H bond is a bigger pool. And alcohols have that big pool. Um, pool is just the word for polar. So polar just means there's a pool. All right. And then the last one is where I get to tell you a story about me. Um, and so these guys really don't react. They are pretty stable. They're really useful in lab. Um, they They tend to be, that's actually something I should mention. They're used a lot as solvents. They're kind of a universal solvent. Uh, so water is called the universal solvent, and it should not be. Why should water not be called the universal solvent? Well, water doesn't because like not. Active? Not quite. It's that is water it, doesn't 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 like the nonpolar. Water only mixes with things that are polar and things that are ionic. These guys, they have nonpolar, right? Like these isopropyl areas or our cycle, and they have the polar. So they're not called the universal solvent, but they're extremely useful as a solvent. Um, and so that's why I said Melanie will run into them in her field. And organic chemistry, they're often used for a lot of experimenting and stuff. I personally won't work with it, uh, because of this except here. So they're not very reactive, so they're really good at dissolving things. So in, in lab, if we had something that didn't dissolve, we actually had something else we would use, and we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Um, and it has to do with, over time, they become this guy down here. They form an epoxy. And if you look at this down here, you should be looking at going, that that or I look at it and go, that does not look like it can be a stable molecule. What's, why would I look at that? Why should you look at that? And maybe you look at it and go, that's cool. It's a triangle. Triangles are awesome. They make tresses and stuff, but these are bonds. What's wrong with this? I mean, it happens, but. Oh. 
the give carbon you a hint. has too many bonds. No, the carbons have four bonds. Did I just write? I did write angle. It's the bond angel. What's the bond angle going to be in the triangle? Triangle 180 degrees, split it three ways. This bond angle is 60 degrees. And up here, all our bond angles are 109 degrees. They like big bond angles. This is like, we just closed this off. And that makes this the exception, which is they become explosive. Um, and so it is why we have in the chemistry lab, so I'm used to teaching and, the, and right next door is the bomb room where we keep all the chemicals. Uh, and it's called a bomb room because the chemicals can become unstable and explode. And so it's surrounded by concrete so the explosion would contain it within there. We actually have special refrigerators in there and the ether is kept in the refrigerator, should be kept in the refrigerator. And the refrigerators are made, I don't know if you ever saw the one Indiana Jones when he gets in the lead line refrigerators so he doesn't get destroyed by the atomic bomb, bomb blast, but they're not quite that, but they would sustain an explosion because back in the 50s or 60s, some chemistry buildings were taken out in universities because of the ether that overnight it just got too old and too much had, um, yeah. Um, so when I worked in lab, this was back like 30 years ago now, um, so this is before email, they, they would put a notice up in the hallway and it was a the, the people like Melanie were coming to pick up the ether and they would do it late at night when nobody's in lab except for graduate students. So as a graduate student, it was two in the morning and I should have been home sleeping and I never read notices. I don't read emails. I read emails from my students and I ignore all the other emails. And um, I came out of my lab. So our lab I came out of one room and was walking down the hall to go in the other room and the elevator is way down the hallway at the next set of labs and we were up on the fourth floor and I saw the elevator doors open these two guys came out and they were in the they look like in the moon suits so if you when you go to like hazardous weight pickup days they're wearing much more calmer ones now but the bunny suits and the respirators and stuff and and so these guys are walking down the hall like these big astronaut suits because they were going to all the labs around Duke University and picking up the ether in the middle of the night when nobody was supposed to be there. Um, and I saw them and I kind of in my head went, this is not good. And I figured out how to lap them because there was a circle. And so I kind of lapped them so they couldn't see me and went down the steps and went home and went to bed. And the next day when I came in, the tech in the lab said, oh, they came and picked up the ether last night, Joyce, were you here? And I just said, Yes, because I didn't realize that's what was going on. I saw I was hallucinating because it was so late and I hadn't slept. Um, but they would come in the full bunny outfits, the full outfits uh, to pick up the ether just to make sure that nothing happened. And so even if it hadn't gone bad, there is those truly have like on egg cartons when they say they're going to go bad. I, I find it always amusing because it's not quite the same as when ether has an expiration date, you take it seriously. Um, so that's about it with ethers. They are polar, but they don't H bond. They really don't react. Um, they're very useful because they will dissolve polar and nonpolar. Um, and so the second category are phenols. So earlier I asked the question um, and Philip said phenol. That's how I say it. Just so I try. I don't know how you say it. Um, to distinguish phenols, this O L ending means an O H, and then this part, the phen, that means a benzene. So it's a benzene with an O H. And kind of back to the question I asked earlier. This is key because we're going to do that game of identifying the O H is directly on the benzene ring. So it's not that you have a molecule with a benzene and an OH like we do here. You That OH would have to be on the benzene ring for it to be a phenol. 
Uh, it is not called an alcohol because the benzene ring does change the properties. Uh, so polar or nonpolar. It's got no H. The six week work. This is like hump day. We get over today, we're past the halfway point. Today is our halfway point. We started five weeks ago, hard to believe, and five weeks from today is our final celebration. Right, like we're gonna make it because we made it, we make it through today. We're closer to the end than to the beginning. So it is polar and it does H bond. So if we were gonna compare it to an ether, it has a higher boiling point because of the H bond. Um, it is um, the key to these. What makes them special is that they are a weak acid. Alcohols are not. You'd have to do a seriously strong base to make an alcohol weak acid. So it means it can donate a hydrogen. And it is specifically this hydrogen that it donates. It is a very weak acid. We're talking a pH of like 6.5. So it, it is slightly acidic, but it is acidic. So we'll just say slightly, very, very weak. But what that means, because we're going to see another game that's going to happen. Look at all these new games we're learning today. Um, because we're learning a whole bunch of functional groups, besides identifying functional groups, we're also going to have where you have test tubes and you have to figure out what's in the test tube. The phenol, you just test it with litmus paper. So litmus is a pH indicator, right? And I actually wrote that wrong. It, it, I had a more succinct way I could have written that. Um, so it turns, turns litmus pink. So when you turn litmus into a pink color, it means you have an acid. So the key with this explanation is because none of you thought about this, everything we've talked about up to this point was neutral pH. Its pH is seven, has no influence on pH. Um, through this, this second celebration, the phenol is the only thing that's gonna affect pH. Everything else is neutral. And so if you have a, you're gonna have a test tube rack of like five or six test tubes and you have to sort them, they're the gnomes and the gnomes are mischievous. They're gonna take all the labels off the phenol you pull that out right away. You just test everything with litmus. You find the one that turns a pink. You have your phenol. And then you can figure out the next one. And that brings us to the thiols because they're really easy to distinguish. So I've mentioned, I find all of these have a strong odor. Uh, when you watch me making the video in lab, I make faces quite a bit. Um, because I, I don't enjoy organic chemistry lab because it has a really strong odor. There are some people who actually enjoy the smell of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's like the smell of diesel. I can't stand the smell of diesel. And so I'm laughing because the, the thing I did with the kids on Friday, the one, the one kid told me his favorite, I was asking him, what's your favorite sm smell? My least favorite smell is the kitty litter box. But um, his favorite smell was the smell of diesel. And I looked at him and I'm like, you guys four wheel all the time. And he's like, yep. And so, um, yeah, so little boy, that was his dream was the smell of diesel meant they got to go four wheeling. Files, you're going to rule them out because they stink. But you can't just tell me it stinks. Um, so you're going to smell all the test tubes. This one, and you're, you're not going to have to smell them. You're going to know which one this is. Does anybody know what a thiol smells like? There's a big hint there for you. Anytime you have the SH, these guys smell like a skunk or rotten eggs. Uh, the smell of onions and garlic. Those are actually pleasant. Those, 
those are thiols, um, but they have longer chains on them. And so that changes the aroma. But some people really can't stand onions and garlic. Joey, when he was little, would not eat onions. And it was probably the smell of them. Um, so that's their big property. They're also going to oxidize. Let's go ahead and name these up here. Naming them is just like an alcohol, except you say thiol instead of. So we number, that's going to be one, two, three, four. This is our methyl group here. So we have one butane thiol. There are other ways to name these, but this is the easiest way. Because it's just like the alcohols, we just say thiol. It's at number one. And then at number three, we have a methyl. And when you see that thiol, um, sulfur it means sulfur it means it's going to have a strong smell and it's going to do some really special stuff inside our body in biochemistry in fact monica and philip just we just talked about this or i refer to it um and it shows up a lot in lesson eight um in our brain there's a lot of sulfurs um and that's gonna i'll get to that in a moment here uh all right if Maybe we'll run into it on the next page. If, if you have two functional groups, the thiol is named as a side group, and it's just called a thiol. So like a methyl, it's named as a thiol. That's what I was trying to say. All right, so hexane, you do your six. And then at number two is your SH. And then at number three is your isopropyl. Apparently, I didn't know how to spell isopropyl. Um, questions about thiols. There's one more piece to them. And that this other piece is something that showed up on your worksheet, and I didn't realize it until, um, yeah, until people were asking me about the worksheet, but you all got it because you probably could Google it. So oxidation is actually a really important reaction in our body. Um, it's one of the key reactions in our body is oxidation reduction. We're going to half of our half of the lecture on Wednesday is on oxidation reduction. Sorry, I was amazed at what time it was because my other class, I'm just finishing the homework set at this time usually. And then I feel pressured for time. So um, oxidation again means Leo. Right, the Leo Gurr thing. Um, again, some of you might have learned it as oil rig, but Leo means losing electrons. Um, but in organic chemistry and biochemistry, rather than looking at electrons, it's actually what we're doing right now in biochem also. Um, instead of looking at the electrons, we look that they lose hydrogens. So if you lose hydrogens, you're oxidized. And the hydrogen we'll lose is that hydrogen that is on the thiol. So primary and secondary alcohols and thiols. Phenols do not. So donating a hydrogen is not the same as losing a hydrogen. I know it's confusing. But um, so please be careful of that. So acid base is not the same as oxidation reduction. Um, so let's just do a simple, let's do um, an ethyl thiol. So you're going to draw two ethyl thiols. So I thought I had the reaction on here, but I did not. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to face them. We're going to mirror them. So the other one we're going to draw backwards. If you want, you can draw it completely backwards, like completely mirror it. It's a good, like, see if you can do it. I don't know if I can. Sorry, this is your teacher. So many of my air class submit, submits their stuff upside down all the time, and I find it quite this brain. But anyway, you don't have to merit perfect like, like I did, but it's fine. 
Um, the H's come back to like question Kaylee had asked me, like, where did the water come from here? It helps to circle those H's. And so what happens is you make a disulfide bridge. So the sulfurs hook up together. And then they have the methyl, the ethyl, sorry, on each side of it or whatever. It could be anything there. So this is the disulfide bridge. I want to point out something because this is really key. That is a covalent bond. That is not a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is an attraction. It's like, hi, how's it going? And you might go and get coffee with them. You might date them. You might hold hands. A covalent bond is if your arm is stuck to your, your, to your body by your shoulder. You're, you can't break it. You need something very serious like an enzyme to come in with a chainsaw and cut this apart. An H bond the same here, like this idea here with an acid, you just put it in water and the hydrogen comes off. Here, you have to have something that's going to react it. So this is an actual reaction, whereas in the acid base, we call it a reaction, but it's just being pulled off the water, just dissociates it. Um, the reason I mention that, what, what it has to do, like in my biochem class, I talk about it. And so for as you take 106 is mercury loves mercury silver and lead are called the heavy metals and they love it's valentine's day this week they love sulfur and your brain is filled with sulfur because that's the neurotransmitter the receptors for all the neuro neurotransmitters in our brain they almost all have sulfur and mercury silver and lead love it and they go in there and they bind and they break that bond. And your neuroreceptors don't work anymore because that bond doesn't hold it together, right? Um, and so that's why these all cause neurological issues. Um, like we don't put lead, we lead like in the 60s and 70s, lead was in gasoline because it kept it from knocking. Uh, and it's probably why silver uh, colloidal silver works so well as a lot of people will clean. Some people swear by it as an anti-bacterial um, agent. And then that's the whole thing with that mercury fillings are not done as frequently as they used to be um, because there is definitely a connection with mercury and uh, brain issues. So, and it's the sulfur in there. All right, questions. And the epoxy, that was supposed to be up there, but that's just what it means. It's it's when the oxygen ends up in this ring position. Um, no questions, everything's quiet. Oh, here we go. I wanted to mention lab to remind you since it was a seven day challenge. So hopefully, you're knee deep in your seven day challenge and that you did one of the others or you did two seven day challenges or something like that. Um, and that you're gonna be submitting it hopefully by Wednesday. Um, if, if you started on Monday, you can be submitting it today or tomorrow and get it out of the way. Uh, and, and remember if you did something like bake the bread that you take a picture of it or your artwork. And also, cause it was a question somebody asked me that there is, a 30 day challenge. So if if you meditated for seven days and you want to go for 30 days um, or you're doing the G bombs for 30 days or you want to giggle and jiggle for 30 days. Um, so at the end of 30 days, there'll be a folder, probably be like the ninth week or you can do a different one every week. So if you meditate and you're like, well, I'm going to giggle and jiggle the next week. And so just keep track and write about it at the end of each week um, and just keep it somewhere nice and you'll submit that and that will be a bonus. Um, yeah, you don't have to, but it's always nice to have some bonus points and hopefully puts you in a nice, maybe that's why you've all been meditating. You're all 
meditating right now in your nice quiet place. So um, I always enjoy reading those. All right. So uh, lab six, that was everything I wanted to mention. Uh, Cause this is the six weeks. So lab six is going to be kitchen chemistry. Um, I am editing it right now and it should be up there tomorrow. If you're somebody who likes to do it during the week, um, it does have bonus points attached to it. So besides doing the lab, there are some challenges you can do for some bonus points. Next, next Wednesday is our celebration. So it's always nice to have bonus points before then. Uh, this lab is due this, this weekend, this Saturday. Um, yeah, and then there's a video that goes along with it that has some bonus points in it, too. So if you're somebody who's like, yeah, I like bonus points, I need bonus points, then that will all be hopefully tomorrow um, for you all. All right. So we're on this page. We're going to make practice makes perfect. And I am going to pause. You can take a break for 10 minutes or you can try this page so on these you are telling me what the functional group is and then your name and your naming we're doing more oh here we're doing isomers so just try this page uh or take a break and then we'll talk about polyphenols so i'm just going to pause and resume all right we're not on that page let's go back to this page practice makes perfect so this is a phenol um, and it is because the OH is directly attached to the benzene ring. So this part here, and so the name, the end of the name is phenol. The phenol, the OH gets to be number one, no matter what. So it is, the game is no longer the lowest numbers possible. It's the lowest numbers possible, but the OH gets to be one kind of how like three-year-olds play when you say share like okay but I get to be number one uh, and so the isopropyl is two and the methyl must be five so two isopropyl uh, if there was only one side group let's say there was only the isopropyl then you can use the OMP remember ortho meta para so we'd say ortho isopropyl phenol but if there's two things, you can't do that. You have to give numbers. Um, and so our methyl is at number five. So two isopropyl, five methyl phenol. All right, this is an ether. And we're going to name it as an ether. There might be a question in the study set where I do the IUPAC name. Um, just for the fun of it, but you don't have to. I think I may have done that. I don't know if I got rid of that question or not um, to show why nobody uses the IUPAC name. And then this over here on this, this is a methyl and that is a tert butyl. And so we're going to put it alphabetically. That's a tert butyl, so T butyl. And then this over here, of course, is our methyl, so T butyl methyl ether. See, with ethers, you use lots of colors. All right, and then the thiol, uh, that's number one, and then two, three, four. So we, it's a butene. There's two ways you could name this. Uh, the, the, the double bond is at two to three, so we'd actually say two butene. And then you could say one thiol. Like you have to have that, the th but they both have to get a number. So you could, you don't have to put the E there. That's kind of, they'd probably put the E there. The other way to do it is to name it as the two butene. And then you say the thiol is an extra piece. So you say one thiol, two butene. Um, I've seen it both ways. And I don't know which one is the official IUPAC, but either way is acceptable. And again, um, I find with students, you guys like about half of you like the one way and half the other way. All right, there is our phenol. 
And then this piece here, this is an ethyl. And so you could say four, because it is at the number four, or you may know what letter. Some cool letters to choose from. P. P for para. So P, ethyl, phenol. All right. Um, technically all one long word. Oh, this brings up a name I haven't taught you. So this is an ether. And that side's a cyclohexyl. So this guy is a C. This is a benzene with an extra carbon. So it's not a phenyl. If the O was attached directly to the ring, it would be a phenyl. It's one that has one extra carbon, just one extra. That is called a benzyl. I don't know. Well, I do know why. Uh, we'll eventually see. What, we'll, we'll see why possibly on Wednesday. Um, so when there's one carbon, uh, then the benzene ring, it's a benzyl. And then cyclohexyl. So on an ether, each side is named as a side group. So that's the YL. Um, these are alcohols. This is a primary alcohol. And that is a secondary alcohol. And I have no idea how you would name this. Um, so I'm not even going to take a stab at it. And you would not have to name something like that. The problem is this is cyclohexanol, but our side group has an alcohol, a, a carbon and an alcohol, and I don't know what you do when that happens. All right, simple lab test. The phenols? Anybody? What are we going to do for the phenols? Litmus paper. Yes. Was that Jeremy? Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen to the litmus paper? You don't have to write the word paper, actually. You can just say litmus. What color are we looking for? Pink. Yeah, so it's going to turn litmus pink. Technically, you would use blue litmus and turn it pink. There's two colors of litmus paper. There's blue and pink. But um, it's it's that it's an acid. You could also say um, there's other types of pH paper that you just test for acidity. Um, you're not going to have <coughs> if you if you had to distinguish these two phenols, then you would probably have to look at boiling point um, because that one's much bigger. Boiling point is not an easy test. All right, um, what's the next one we want to distinguish? Somebody else. The thiol. The thiol. What are we going to do for the thiol? Are we going to smell that one? Because it's going to smell like skunks or rotten eggs. Yeah, so don't just say stinks. You want to tell me, was that Christy? That was Melanie. That was Melanie. Thank you. Smells like rotten eggs. Or smells like skunk would be easier. Uh, or have you ever been to Yellowstone? Um, Yellowstone National Park, when you go there, the smell is a sulfur. Uh, the hot springs, most hot springs. I've actually never been to the hot springs near here, and so I don't know if they're sulfur-based, uh, but that smell is thiol. Um, I have my pen. All right, so we've ruled out the thiol and the phenol. What else? Anybody? Thoughts? Would our last one be ethers? So thank you for saying, well, I don't, there is one more test we can do, which is for the alcohol. Does anybody know what we would do? Oops. Wow. What would we do for the alcohol?
<laughs> your uh, Wi-Fi is acting up, Philip. So sorry. I find I love Zoom. I'm gonna really miss this in live person, and I don't know if that happens to my voice. I know it does occasionally on the video, but it came out. Um, you would oxidize is the is really the best thing to do for alcohol. I don't know if that's what you were saying. You came out in slow motion. Um, it is because it's a primary or, and secondary. And the oxidize, it changes color. Um, again, the lab that I videotaped, I'm trying to decide uh, if I need to re-videotape, uh, is a lab where it goes through seven different things and you see the color changes. Um, so somebody had said something about the ether. So the ether is going to always be the last tube standing. There is no test for the ether. Um, so you basically have identified all the other ones. Now, the order that you do the test in is actually important. You want to rule out thiol. You got to get that one out of there because it also oxidizes. Um, and so we got to pull that one out by the smell, pull out the phenol, and then do an oxidation. The ether will, the ether does nothing. Um, and so that's actually, I go through with an unknown with the seven tests. I can't remember if my unknown was what, what it was, but um, yeah, the ether doesn't. So I mentioned this because I'm pretty sure it's a question at the end of your worksheet. And a lot of people will say, let's see if the ether explodes. So in this game, to distinguish it, you have to survive the game. So blowing up, that, that's not really a good distinguishing feature of the ether. Um, so the ether is the last one standing. We can't identify it. The ether is, you know, I've had people say, oh, take a whiff of it and see if you knock yourself out. Well, then you're not going to remember anything because you just knocked yourself out for a short time. Um, so when I was born, my mom was given a whiff of ether. I was a twin and they decided we're going to deliver her. Um, and so that's the anesthesia they use. All right, we're going to name these and then we're trying to decide if they're an isomer of dipropyl ether. So the key with dipropyl ether, how many carbons does dipropyl ether have? Two propyls. Each propyl has three, so it has six carbons. Ether means we're going to have one oxygen and we're everything single bonds. So this is really what we're looking for is six carbons and one oxygen. So they all have the one oxygen. They all have the single bonds. Um, so like here we have one, two, and then one, two, three. So two plus three, this is not an isomer. But we can name it. It is an ether. And this is a propyl. This is an ethyl. So we just say ethyl propyl ether. A lot of students actually, ethers end up being one of their favorite to name because they're so simple to name. All right, next one. Again, we have an ether. So. We have one, two, and then over here, one, two, three, four. So this will be an isomer because we have six carbons. This side's ethyl. What is this side? Four is carbons. It, is it butyl? Go ahead. What kind of butyl, Caitlin? Sec butyl? It is sec butyl because it's attached to the second in the butyl. Uh, that's where the name sec butyl comes from. So sec butyl starts with a B because it is hyphenated. So you actually say it first. So it's sec butyl ethyl ether. Sec butyl and tert butyl. So like up here, tert butyl also started with a B because they're hyphenated. Isobutyl, isopropyl start with an I. 
All right, next one is not an isomer. We got way too many carbons. I'm pretty sure, yeah, one, two, three, four. And this is one, two, three. So this is isopropyl. And this is just a regular butyl. So this is four in a row. So back to the question Caitlin just answered, just to make sure you all see, this is a sec butyl, and this is a regular one. And there's our monkey in the middle, um, which is our ether. So I'm pondering if any of you are, are year of the monkey. I'm trying to remember what year year of the monkey is. Um, does anybody know if they're a monkey? Sherpa New Year's this week. Who who said that? Really? Yeah, I was thinking, were you there when I did the whole monkey thing as a kid when it was year of the uh, monkey? I don't remember. So how old are you? Um, I'm 16. I was born in 2004. So if anybody's 28, you're also a monkey. Monkeys, there's a reason we have like monkey business. Monkeys are um, are really fun. They're not the trickster. That was the year of the rat. The year of the rat is going to be over in a couple of days. Hooray, two and a half days. Um, so this was not because we have seven carbons. All right, this one is dipropyl, one, two, three. So it is not an isomer because it is dipropyl ether. It is the same thing. So yeah, remember that game where you had two things and you had to say if they were the same, if they were isomers or they were unrelated? Um, you all loved that game. All right, alcohols and ethers are isomers. Why? Assuming we have the same number of carbons. Because they're all single bonds and they have an oxygen. So they're saturated uh, and they have an oxygen. There's no double bonds. So they will come out isomers. Um, all right, so let's just count if we have one, two, three, four, five. This one, nope, we don't have six carbons. This is just now. You can't just call it pentanol. You do have to have the number. Uh, so one pentanol, it's a primary alcohol. The common name for this, just so you, uh, in case you care, is pentyl alcohol. So the common name is kind of like uh, the ether, where we just say the word alcohol at the end and we say, hey, it has a pentyl. But we have to indicate that it's a straight chain, five carbon and it's at the end, so they put a little N. The N stands for normal, so it means it's at the one and it's just a straight chain. Um, again, I mentioned that because uh, like Melanie, I know you'll run into that because that used to be how everybody always labeled them. Um, all right, next one. Uh, we want a number, so the OH has the lowest number possible, and this does have six carbons. So it is an isomer of our dipropyl ether. And you just say it's a three hexanol. I don't know what the common name would be because I don't know how to do that. All right, next one. Green. Um, sorry, that would be number one. That is number two, three, four, five. So the OH does not have to be at number one, and it is not here. So this is a two pentanol with a methyl, so four methyl, two pentanol. And it is an isomer because there are six total carbons and one oxygen and all single bonds. All right. And then our last one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We got a three hexanol again. So still an isomer of the ether. Look at that, half of them are isomers. Questions with the names or the isomer part? All right, and then at the bottom of the page, next page goes fast, uh, pentene. So this is interesting. We're just going to go with it and say we had to rename them. Um, so if that's four, and then two gets the OH, um, I think this one's named wrong. I'm pretty sure the double bond 
carbon double bond always gets preference for naming, but it didn't ask us to rename it. Um, all right, and then like this one, the um, YNE. So remember triple bonds, if you draw it with the zigzags, one, two, three, all come out straight because it is a linear. Uh, and then we zigzag to four, five, six. And then at three, we stick the SH coming off. So there's our SH. You don't have to circle it. I'm just making sure you see that. All right. And then it went to hexanol. At number three, we're going to have a phenol. Not a phenol, but it means a benzene. So make sure you put the ring in it and an OH. So what classification of alcohol is that last one? Tertiary. It is a tertiary. Why? Because that what the, the carbon the OH is attached to is attached to um, three other carbons. So Ezra, I'm going to make you really earn it. Will this oxidize? Um, I don't know. Anybody want to help him? It will not because it has three bonds. So basically yeah. it has like too many bonds to oxidize. So oxidation, we lose hydrogens. And what happens, so when I taught it, I taught exactly how Bianca just said it is, but this, this position, it loses this hydrogen and the hydrogen that would be here, but there is no hydrogen there because there's already all those bonds there. So there's no hydrogen to lose to be oxidized. So tertiary doesn't oxidize. Um, any questions from this page? All right, we're not on that page yet. Let's look at this page. Um, and um, you are all writing a paper and doing a presentation on an organic molecule. It is only the beginning of the sixth week. This is in the 10th week. Uh, most people don't pick something till the eighth or ninth, but I want that on your radar. Um, so uh, Philip and Monica, it can't be the same thing as your 106, but it is a slightly different um, that it has to be, you're picking an organic molecule. Uh, and then you do, I, I'll put the thing up there this week um, with the parameters who I'm looking for. You do have to find two like scientific studies about it. You want to do the paper on something that strikes your interest. So you're going to see a page like this in the notes um, pretty much every class from here on out. Uh, and it's just trying to get you, you want to do something that you want to learn more about. Um, these spices that are used in chai, the word chai means spice tea. Um, they, they actually are just all rock stars for everything, for anti-inflammation, um, like for everything. There's so much information on any one of them. This is actually really cool. So eugenol is what's in cloves. That's what that picture is there. That's the smell of cloves. A lot of incense. It's actually incredibly wonderfully smelling incense. A lot of um, essential oils for smell and stuff. Uh, this is in there. And so um, has a lot of medicinal uses. And then this is an isomer of it. And this is nutmeg. And so the fragrance of nutmeg, if we were in class, I would actually pass it around because most of you probably have it in your kitchen. Because um, so nutmeg is one of the pumpkin um, pie spices that makes it very distinct um, beyond cinnamon. Like we all know the smell of cinnamon, but nutmeg has makes it more pumpkin, pumpkin spicy versus cloves, which is actually very different. And you can see they look almost the same, except right there are double bond. Um, moved from being at the end over one. And that makes all the difference for the taste and the smell and stuff. 
Um, yeah, and the reason it's on this page, what we're going to do with this, everybody's having funky Wi-Fi today, um, is we're going to also walk through identifying, it, it's to spark your interest. Uh, this is, I don't know if anybody did it, that you could make a new, like if you made curry, pretty much you're using all of these, but um, identifying functional groups. So you'll see a section, we'll see this on Monday, we'll do a practice for the celebration, but you'll have arrows and you would say, okay, that's an ether. That is not an alcohol because the OH is attached to the benzene. So that is a phenol. Um, and then probably the other piece would be an alkene up here. That's, that's again what I mean by functional group. And it would be the same for iso -eugenol. Again, these are cloves. Um, this, this is actually probably my favorite. It was when I was a kid, my dad loved licorice. And so it's almost Lent um, and Easter time, but um, this is anise or the flavoring of licorice. And so this past Friday I did a smell test. Usually we do this in lab that you guys get 25 unidentified things and you have to smell it and tell me what it's the smell of because it is actually these. So they all got that it was licorice. I was amazed. Um, it's hard to see, but this, this, these are uh, mind and print in color. This is oxygen. If yours printed in color, it showed up as red. Um, this is a benzene ring, so it's an arene or an aromatic. Uh, it's not a phenol because this is actually an ether. And they do, they have these, all of these have these really aromatic, um, apparently it's it's like one of the best things for osteoporosis. Uh, one of the problems with, with the chai when you get it in Nepal and India is they just put the mother load of sugar uh, and then they put the fake milk in it. All right, anybody know, oh, oh this, is L, this is cinnamon. So it turns out, this is really weird, so, there is a My Little Pony for every one of these spices now. So this was, um, yeah, coriander. Uh, and this was ginger. And, and they had them for all of them. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. But um, that's why those pictures are there, because I thought that was really funny. So this is ginger and cinnamon, which there's so much information. And history on all of these is actually really cool. The thing that I wanted to point out about cinnamon, or actually, this is a good bonus question. Anybody know what's that functional group? Carboxyl. Almost. It's an aldehyde. So it's actually called a carbonyl. The carboxyl, Philip, is when there's two oxygens. So the double oxygen groups we're going to be doing after the celebration, so in two weeks. Um, but this is an aldehyde. This is where our lesson is on Wednesday. Usually cinnamon I put there, but I was talking about spiced tea. Uh, these guys are ethers because there is this carbon in between, so the oxygens are not attached to each other. We have not learned this group, so I would not ask you for that on the this celebration, or if it showed up, um, that's an amide. Again, that is, that's, these are, the last ones we do are the nitrogens, which is a real bummer, because, um, uh, anyway, so pepper. Somebody always picks capsation, um, but, Pepperine is actually phenomenal, all the stuff it does in regular black pepper. And actually, true chai, they put the black pepper is in there. I remember the first time Pimba told me, and I'm like, what are you talking about? That's so weird. Uh, this is turmeric, the spice in turmeric. So we see here an ether and here a phenol. Um, these guys both of them are ketones. So I'm giving you these because um, you should be, after Wednesday, be able to identify an aldehyde or ketone if you saw in a picture. And this is kind of cool because it mirrors itself. So if you notice, it mirrors itself around the ketones. 
Uh, so it's one molecule that comes together, which is really cool. Uh, ginger down here. There's actually several different molecules in ginger. Um, I just picked the one that we could identify. So that's just a secondary alcohol. That there is a ketone. That's a phenol. That's an ether. So you can see there's all these functional groups in all of these. Um, and so that's the idea that we'll see um, some of these pictures again. These guys are really cool. I put them there, one, because coriander, um, in case you don't know, coriander is the seed for cilantro. So if you grow cilantro and you don't pick it and it goes to seed, the seed is coriander. Uh, some people can't stand cilantro, but coriander is truly in chai. It is one of the spices. It's like essential to curries and stuff from India. But if you look at these two molecules, they are actually mirror images. So that wedge to the OH is saying that the OH is pointing out of the paper at you. And then the dot, 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 dot to the methyl um, is saying it's going behind the paper. And so these are what are left and right hand mirror images. So uh, in, in biochemistry, that's important. And actually it turns out in spices, in, in smells, the coriander has a very different taste and a very different smell than lavender um, or this one. This is, yeah, the smell of lavender. All right. Um, one more page. Any questions with that? It's kind of cool. Lots of fun. All right. I don't know if any of my artists made me another work of art. Maybe you can be inspired by all the. There, somebody made a Sherpa, My Little Pony. It's in my office, though. It's just a picture of me. I'm a unicorn. I want you to know. And this was 20 years ago before there was a unicorn. It was a mother and daughter in my class. Um, the mother was very sad, very, actually very jealous because she had never gotten to be a my, whatever they called my little pony. I never had one of those. I'm too old for that. All right. We're going to go through this, this practice. Um, I'm going to ignore the first two. We actually did them. They were actually on the previous one. Um, so just, you can go back to our notes on alcohols. We already named them. Um, I want to focus on our other ones. So there's the oxygen. Let me give you like two minutes. You can try naming, you can try drawing. I'll give you two minutes. You can keep working and kind of have me in the background. All right, this one we're gonna name is ether. On this side we have one, two, which is ethyl. In this side we just have one, two, three, four, five. So we just call it ethyl. Pental ether. IUPAC name, because somebody always asks, is pentane. And then we say at the one position, we have an ethoxy. So the oxygen and the ethyl are named as a side group attached at the number one position of the pentane um, in case you like want to go that way. All right, this is a thiol. It gets to be number one. So two ethyl cyclohexane thiol. And again, thiol has to be at number one. All right, which ones go through oxidation? Uh, a, B, and D. So the alcohols were both primary alcohol. I just didn't name them in the interest of time. So oxidation again is primary and secondary alcohols and thiols. We're going to add to that on Wednesday. Um, but for your the last question on the worksheet, uh, yeah, primary, secondary alcohol and the thiol. All right, which ones are water soluble? I don't think any of them are. There's too many carbons. It's 
so I I really don't think any of them would be. Um, so highest boiling point. So if somebody wants to get their name up on the board. You want to pick one and tell me why. So so far I got Ezra, Caitlin, Emma, Kaylee, Philip, Jeremy, and Melanie. Go ahead. B. I'll go with B. Y. Vincent. Because you have uh, more carbon bonds compared to the other ones. So it has the most carbons. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. That that's one of the reasons, but there's a second reason, which is the which has to go folk before that. Um. It has a lot of side groups. It has the H bond. It actually does have more carbons than A. But the reason is, is the H bond. So when we do our hierarchy for boiling point, H bond is the top. And then the polar ones. And then the um, nonpolar ones. So there's going to be a hierarchy. So the ones that H bond are the alcohols and phenol. But um, yeah. All right. So almost done. When you draw the phenol, this is probably the most missed thing on your next celebration. Vincent, what's wrong with my picture? Um, it's a meta, so we have to have another uh, carbon oxygen. Or well, meta another would carbon. be the chlorine. Oh, what does meta mean? Um, Do you remember? Two, three. It means it's at one and three. So the OH gets to be at one, and this has to be at three. But does anybody else see what's wrong with my picture? You don't have the circle in the middle? Yeah. Was that Christy this time? Yes, it was. You did make it. You said you had technical trouble. Um, I'll give it to both of you. Yeah, so remember with phenols, you have to have the circle or show the extra lines around. But um, meta does mean we're at the one and the three position, so chlorine would be there. Uh, isopropyl, so just on each side. And then here we have a thiol. We want our cyclohexane. So no circle on this one. We just do our hexagon. And the thiol didn't get a number because in a cyclo, it gets the functional group gets to be number one. And so at number three, we put the ethyl. We do not use meta on this because it's not flat. So only on benzenes do we use that. All right. So uh, last thing is our distinguishing thing. And we already did it. One of them is going to smell like skunks, which is the thiol. Um, the pH test, right? So this is going to be litmus pink for the phenol, for the thiol, uh, skunk smell. Oof. And this one is last tube standing. All right, so any questions? I'm gonna stop and 